Today's scripture reading will come straight from the beginning, Genesis 1-1. Again, if you do not have a Bible, we have a free one for you today, so just slip your hand up and we will get one to you. Right at the beginning, Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning, the first day. And this is the word of our Lord God, Jesus Christ. We are starting our new series, Origin. Um, you will see that all over social media. We are taking it back straight to the beginning. So invite your friends, invite your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sisters, everybody. Um, I'm really excited about this series. So y'all give it up for P. Amen. Let's give God some praise. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. You may be seated. You may be seated. You may be seated. Uh, let's go to God in prayer. Uh, if you've got a Bible, cool. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Uh, Genesis is the first book of the Bible. If it takes you more than two minutes to find it, uh, let us intercede. Let's have some intercessory prayer. I want to lay hands on you and Cast that demon out that will not allow you to find the first chapter. So if you've got it, say amen. amen. If you don't, say out. If you need a Bible, raise your hand, and if they'll get some Bibles to you. Just raise your hand. Need a Bible? Anybody need a Bible in the place? All right, I've got one right here. I've got two. I've got three. Uh, kinfolk, where my kinfolk at? Cool. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. They're going to get some Bibles to you. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Uh, I'm going to go to God in prayer. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for God, all that you do, God. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us an opportunity, Lord, to uh, really, God, come together and worship you uh, in spirit and in truth. We pray, Father, that uh, this uh, message today in this series for the next few months would uh, help us to see the God of the universe who happens to also be the God of our Bible. We also pray, God, that you would help us to see that out of seeing you that we would see ourselves. Lord, for so many of us, we look for purpose in other things, but Lord, I pray, God, that our people will come to realize that when they come to know you, they have come to know themselves. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, that those of us who were made by our maker would come to see the instruction manual of the word of God. And we would come to see that it is our manual for how we to, are to live, behave, flourish, subdue. multiply, grow, and make evident the kingdom of our God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, I just pray, Lord, man, whatever hung down hearts that came in, Father, I pray that you would lift them up as they come to know the joy that comes from knowing and hearing about you, Father. I pray, God, that this news literally would literally be good news. I pray, God, for those of us who are struggle, struggling in our Bible reading, I pray, God, that today may be a catalyst that we would um, maybe, Father, just read a little more tomorrow than we did today. And, Father, I pray, God, that out of the joy that comes from coming to know you, we wouldn't be selfish and stingy. We would pass it on, sharing with the world that needs to know who our Lord Jesus Christ is. We pray these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give God some praise in the place. So, in the late 90s, there was this show called Seinfeld, 
Now, it's interesting, Seinfeld was uh, a show that I actually did not watch. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you why I didn't watch it, and I, and I began to realize why I didn't like Seinfeld. Seinfeld was, uh, I'd turn on Seinfeld, and every week it'd be the same old characters, there's like four people, uh, I guess George, Kramer, and I forgot the ladies, Elaine and Seinfeld, and every week they would show these random scenes, and at the end of these scenes, there'd be these laughs, and I didn't get the jokes. <laughs> I didn't get the jokes, and I didn't get how, I mean, I didn't see no plot, I didn't see no flow. Every week, it looked like they were at the same places, talking about the same stuff. There was no setup for a punchline. It was, I mean, there was no structure, at least for me, in the show that I, and so, consequently, I would turn on Seinfeld, and I would flick off and, and, and turn to Martin, and that's what I would watch. Not, the 90s was filled with Martin Lawrence moments. It wasn't until I grew a little older that I realized that Seinfeld was actually a show about nothing. And that they were purposely, I was like, who would do this on purpose? Create this boring show on purpose. Now I'm not, you know, nothing against anyone. I'm just telling you my experiences when I was, you know, in the 90s, you know. Uh, so, so I was like, who would create, and so, when I began to discover that the show was about nothing and that the show reflected the, the ages, the age that we're in. Um, and basically, look, if, if the world comes from a Big Bang Theory and one day, billions of years ago, uh, the world exploded and, and then uh, things evolved from a little amoeba to everything that you see and Men came from monkeys or primates or whatever the latest theory is. And if all these things actually happen, then a consequence of that is that everything we do in this life is meaningless. And so when I would watch Seinfeld, it was unlike any other sitcom that I would see. Because every other sitcom, I don't care how ratchet it was, at the end of it, they came to some type of moral. Right? Like, I watched Married with Children, and so uh, that wasn't a show that kids should watch. There was a lot of sexual innuendo in the show. But at the end, there was always this moral, and there was always this principle, and people lived on heavily after that. But with Seinfeld, there'd be just crazy random stuff happening to people, and there just wouldn't be anybody saying, oh, that's bad, or oh, that's good. Like, uh, there was this one episode where uh, they created these rickshaw cabs. I don't know if you've ever been downtown and you've seen these uh, rickshaw cabs. They're supposed to be drawn uh, by horses, but they created this business, but they didn't really know how they were going to get these cabs like move because they needed people. And so they found these homeless Vietnam vets uh, on the street and they got them and just had them moving these rickshaw cabs. And you watch these scenes, you're like, man, you, you know, they had no respect for anybody. Homeless people, Vietnam veterans, nothing. And so it was just, that was supposed to be funny, right? And so, man, at, at the end of that show, and what you realize is the show reflected the times that we were living in and that we're living in now. If there is no God and he did not create the world in seven days, then that means that there is no, no right or wrong, that everything we do is meaningless and everything we do is purposeless and... What you, think you ought to, what you think is right is cool, and what I think is right is cool, and as long as we can uh, coexist in tolerance and in goodwill, then everything will be all right and the world will be okay. See, a lot of this comes from this idea that uh, God is not the creator of the universe, and that since he's not the creator of the universe and he doesn't exist, that men just take the universe into their own hands and do what they want to do. And so I know a lot of us grew up in schools and in uh, workplaces and even now in just secular philosophies such as these. And so what I wanted to do with this series was to help us see that God has a greater purpose, uh, not only for creation, yes, and not only for his people, but for you. So for a few minutes, I want to talk from the thought origin. And I want to look at Genesis chapter 1. 
And I really just want to make one point, and then I'm going to sit down today. There's a lot, man. Genesis is chock full. You're going to have to do some reading on your own. Uh, I'm going to hit the highlights, but we're not going to hit everything, and this isn't going to be comprehensive. Uh, a lot of times what I realize is that I baby our congregation. Like, I don't put it in your hands to go and read your Bible for yourself. Most of us have, are in jobs or in schools where they're like, we're, some, most of y'all are like the top of your feel doing whatever you're doing. But for whatever reason in church, we just baby you and act like you're just uh, eighth graders. So this, this series, my challenge, on top of all the challenges we'll make, is that you actually read Genesis for yourself. Write down any critical questions that you may have. I, look, there's gonna be a, tons of questions. Uh, at the end of service, I'll be in the back meeting with our visitors, and if you so happen to have a question, that is on your mind and you want to ask, you can ask that question then. If I can answer it, I'll be like, sure, let's sit down. If I can't, I'll say, hey, man, let me do, do me a favor. Bring that question next week. I have an answer for you. If I don't, then I'll find somebody who does. All right? We good? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. He literally says this. In the beginning was... In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse, or up there, heaven, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And then he says, and God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together. He called sea and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which there is seed and each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which there is their seed, each according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. There was evening, there was morning the third day, and God said, let there be lice in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lice in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth, and it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars, and God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the water swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed him saying, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth and there was evening and there was morning the fifth day and God said let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds and it was so God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind and God saw that it was good good then he said, let us, then he said, let us, then he said, let us, then he said, let us. Then he said, let us. 
make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth. Everything that has the breath of life, I've given, I have given every green plant to you for food. And it was so. And God saw that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. He then declares in verse 1 of 2, he says, Then the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. And made it holy because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Tag this text origin, the big idea that I hope that you gather from today is this, that uh, God is the sovereign creator of some things in the universe. No, no, not some things. Uh, God is the sovereign creator of half of the things in the universe. No, sorry, I can't read. He says, God is the sovereign creator of everything, everything in the universe. So that we who realize this ought to worship and serve him as king. The first point that I want you to see, because we're only going to look at one verse today, so all we got time for, one verse, and that's verse 1. The first thing that I want you to see is that uh, God is the sovereign creator of time. God is sovereign over time. This word sovereign means that he is all-powerful, a sovereign uh, like President Obama is a president, but he's not sovereign. Uh, places where they're kings or dictators, all the power and authority in that nation, in that state, all belong to that one person. So here, when we say God is sovereign, we're saying that God is king of the universe and that everything in the universe, everything in the universe, God has total and complete control, and power over it. So when you say God is sovereign, you're saying God is powerful and he's, he's, he's sovereign. What is he sovereign over Texas? No, no, he's not sovereign over, over Texas. Is he sovereign over the United States of America? No, 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 he's not sovereign over the United States of America. Is he sovereign over the planet Earth? No, he's not sovereign over the planet Earth. He's sovereign over everything that has ever been created and everything even above that, God is sovereign. And so what we'll see in the text first is that God is sovereign over time. If you look at verse 1, verse 1 says what? In the beginning who? 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 It, if he says in the beginning God, that must mean that there must have been a beginning before the beginning began. Because if God was there at the beginning, that must mean he, was, he must have been there before there was a beginning. So what, that, what the text already tells you is that before there was time, before there was a, a concept of time, before there was a, 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 a ticking clock that moved in a linear fashion, that there was God. That, that, that the person we call God, or what the Hebrews would write in, in this passage, Elohim, that he is sovereign over time, that, that he created time for his glory, and that before there was time, there was God. There has never been a time that there has not been God. 
But when there was no time, there was God. So before the beginning began, there was no beginning. But there was God. And so literally when you, when you, when you read the text and you, you, you hear him say in the beginning, what you realize is that if God is before there was time, anything that you could call and describe God, he must be that and all of that. So he is omniscient. Omni, omniscient means all-knowing, meaning before there was time, there was knowledge. And all the knowledge there was and there would, would, would have been was all in God. God never learns new developments. God is never blindsided by the things we might be blindsided. God is not like busy over here and somebody says, did you read this great book? I think it would help you. See, before there was time, there was God and all the knowledge that there ever was, was in God. He's omniscient. Not only is God omniscient, God is uh, omni omnipotent, which means all powerful, means that any power that was in the universe, it all resided in God. That all the power that there ever was and there ever will be and that you ever had is all in God. Sometimes we think that the people who have power over us or we uh, somehow, some way, uh, do not get their authority and power from God. But see, when he writes in the beginning, he's trying to tell those of us who feel purposeless that in the beginning, God was there. Before the beginning, God was there. And everything that we see is under the sovereign control of God, that he is not only omniscient, he's om omnipotent. He's not only omnipotent, but he's omnipresent. Because watch this, without time, you can't have space. And since God uh, created time, that must mean that he doesn't need space. He's everywhere at all times. There is never a time, there's never a, excuse me, there's never a place that God isn't. That God, that God isn't like, you know, sometimes we're like, let's invite God into the space. I'm like, um... God's like, hey, can I come in? I mean, is it okay? Is, is it, can, I, can I get uh, access to where you guys are worshiping me? Right? No, no, no. He, he's like, no, he's omnipresent. He was before there was even space. In fact, the space is created for his glory. Not ours. See, sometimes we have the, so our default position as rebellious human beings is that things are created for our glory. Some of y'all like, no, I'm not. No. Look, these, these kids running around here, they think the world is created for their glory. See, what happens is you just become more sophisticated in your worship of yourself, right? You're not going to like whine and throw a fit, right? You just, you just go spend the money. Or you go spend somebody else's money. Or you bar beg, borrow, steal till you can get it. Like, that's just how we do, right? Right? So, so a lot of times, man, our default position is that things are created for our glory. And so we say things like, let's invite God into the space. Well, we never think, man, no, do you know that the reason why we're in this space is because God invited us into it? So he says he's sovereign over time, that he created time. But God is not only sovereign over time, but he's sovereign over space and matter. It says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And in the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He tells us that in the very beginning that God, Elohim, no one else. See, at this particular time when they got, the, when they got this writing, because uh, the whole Pentateuch, which is uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all came as a package to Moses. And then Moses gave that as a package to his people. So, of course, Moses was not there at the beginning. 
See, but he did go up the mountain, and what him and God were talking about were the things that we are now reading. And so now Moses, straight from God's mouth, is giving us the account of what happened at the beginning. In their particular time and context, there were many beginning stories. There was the Babylonians, and there was a story that the Egyptians have. I cannot share that story today. I was like, can I? Because it's very sexually perverse. Just go Google it. Go read it. It's disgusting, too. Not even perverse. It's disgusting. Like, these stories were out there. I'll tell you the Babylonian story. I feel like that's still R, and it's okay. So the Babylonian story, the god Marduk. Marduk decides that uh, before time, there's these other gods that are around, and he needs to get rid of them. One of them is, uh, is a she-god named Tiamat. So Marduk says, Tiamat time for you to die. Marduk kills Tiamat, tears her into two, takes, uh, takes half of her and builds heaven, and takes the other half of her, builds the earth, and builds Babylon. And then when he's finished, he takes this other god, he crushes him, kills him, takes his blood, and then builds man and woman. So uh, the Babylonians the God that they serve wasn't very godly, right? Uh, very violent. Uh, we see he's violent. We see he hates women gods, at least. I don't know about women. He hates women gods uh, and hates them and, you know, wants to destroy them. Um, he's not very, really friendly with any other gods, and he thought so highly of us that he would use the blood of his conquered god victim and create humans. And so any wonder why the Babylonians were how they were, right? And uh, there's some terrible, other terrible stories about how God uh, brought the world into existence by many other people. And so at this particular time, God wants to tell his people his side of the creation story. Because the devil and his minions have been making up lies about the God of the universe and making him seem very ungodly. So God uses this man Moses to let the world know that this is what happened. There was not Marduk and Tiamat and this person and that person, that they're all before, before creation, there was only one God, and that God created, this, world crea this word created is interesting, because when you read, because I'm going to let you read Genesis, when you read the word created, the word in the Hebrews bara, but when you read it, you will see that the word created is only associated with one individual in the Bible, God. That whenever anybody else makes or fashions something, they don't use create, they use the word make. Even with God, when he makes something, it indicates that he, uh, that he, made something out of something that already existed. But it's interesting when they use the word create, create every time it's used with God is to symbolize that, that there was nothing pre-existing, that out of nothing, something was made. What the writers will say, creation ex nihilo, that, that, that God created out of nothing that he spoke and worlds were created, and that this word created is only associated and attached to one person, God. It's to say that anybody else who calls themselves creator or creative, right, they all need to bow to the actual creator because ain't nobody else creating something out of nothing. Oh, y'all, oh, y'all, y'all. Y'all not with me. Let, me, let me. let me give you a couple places where you can read this. Hebrews 11 and 3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Job 38, 4 through 7, this is God himself. He says, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me. If you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or, or what were its base sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Psalm 33 and 6 will say this. By, what, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. Psalm 136 and 5 will say, 
to him who understanding made the heavens for his steadfast love endures forever, that there is one creator, only one person crea can create something out of nothing, that before there was God, there was nothing. But after God decided in eternity past, I don't know, because God doesn't age, I, I have to call it eternity past, God doesn't change because he's, you know, change means that time has occurred. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we have to re re uh, refer to his past as eternity past. Sometime in eternity past, I guess, you know, his plan for the world, he, he didn't develop the plan because he didn't have time. So everything God was going to do, he already knew he was going to do. for all time and all eternity. So the Bible says that he, when he created the world, he created the heavens and the earth. Heavens and earth is uh, the technical term for heavens and earth is this word called merism. It means the heavens, uh, so, so when they would talk, heaven would mean uh, everything up there as far as they could see, right? And earth would be everything down here. Now, it's interesting to talk, when you talk about the universe, the, the, uh, our astronomers, they say that the universe is 46 billion light years and still growing. What does that mean? That means that if you got in your car and you could travel the speed of light and you were trying to get to the end of the universe, it would take you 46 billion years to get there and by the time you got there, it would have probably doubled in size. That this is the universe that God created and is small in comparison to the God of the universe. So that he creates time and, and he creates space and he creates matter out of nothing. And that everything that we have and enjoy now and everything that we make and manufacture is out of things that God has already created. So what the writer wants us to understand is that I don't care how high you climb up the ladder and I don't care how big your buildings are and how much money you place in your bank account, all of it was created by the creator and that we are just copiers or images of somebody greater. So not only is he the creator of time, creative uh, space and matter, but to really like grab a hold of this, man, you're gonna have to do something. You got your Bibles, you got your Bibles? John chapter one, John chapter one. And I'm, I'm gonna give us, a, you, I want you to write what I'm about to say down because I think it will aid you in just general Bible study. John chapter 1. So it's interesting because the Old Testament conceals, uh, re conceals the redeemer of the universe. So when you're trying to read your Bible, it's particularly the Old Testament. Anybody had problems reading the Old Testament, right? Seems like a bunch of stories. Usually when I hear Old Testament uh, preaching or teaching or sharing stories, it's usually out of the greater context of what God's trying to communicate. Usually it's a, a Christian sounding like a Jewish man. And what do I mean by that? I mean, uh, without the redemptive story of Jesus Christ, you are left with Jewish stories, right? And so in order to truly understand the Old Testament, you've got to read it in light of the New Testament. So sometimes when people say, I'm going to read the Bible cover to cover, I say, hey, start with the New Testament first, then go back to Genesis. Why? Because when you get to Leviticus, you're like, man, I don't get it. Well, but if you've already read Hebrews, you can then, you know, I, I'll be honest, I've never read Leviticus cover to cover. I always cheat. I use Hebrews, and Hebrews helps me understand Leviticus. And then I write those cliff notes down, and then I share with you. Okay? I have never read it cover to cover. I'm not doing any Bible studies on it. I have so many books on it, and I, I just can't pick it up. I'm like, I can cheat. I can, I can see what Jesus was trying to do with Leviticus through Hebrews. 
Y'all with me? So in order for you to grasp what's going on in Genesis, especially this first verse, you're going to have to look at John chapter 1. Anybody have John chapter 1? Because the question you ought to ask is, okay, how does this relate to Jesus, who is my Savior? I don't see his name mentioned anywhere. I see Elohim. I see that the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. I see that he says, let us make man in our image. So I'm getting hints and shadows that something else is happening through God and with God, but I don't really get it. Like, I need to have some clarity. And so John chapter 1, if you have it, everybody have it? Anybody don't? He literally says this in verse 1. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Y'all see that? All things were made by him, and was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in darkness, and the darkness could not comprehend. Or well, for some of y'all, the darkness could not overtake it. Y'all with me? Uh, so then, skip down to verse 14, right? He'll say, and this word became, he became flesh. This word, whoever this word guy is, was not only in the beginning with God. See, John's like, look, Moses didn't complete the story because God didn't allow him to. But he has revealed himself through this man named the Word. And he says, in the beginning, that Word that you were going to see, who, who, who had manifested himself as the man Jesus, that same guy was, didn't just come up out of Mary's womb, but he was actually before Mary, before anything that had ever been created. In fact, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and watch this, he says, and the word was God. He says, this word then became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld him. And we, we looked at, we get, beheld means I stared. You ever beheld somebody before? I, I know you have. Right? Just, just nod your head. Look, she, she right there. She like, look, I hope you beholding me. Amen. Right? He says, and we beheld, we stared, we lingered. Right? The glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So what John tries to tell you is that in the beginning, this guy who was the Word, who became flesh, and he was Jesus. So I, I want you to, first of all, you got to be, the, the, the word in the Greek is logos, but when, when you hear Word, when you speak, I, I, I want to help us, like, like, bring this close. When you speak, two things happen. Uh, a lot of things happen. Uh, hopefully good things when you speak, right? Uh, hopefully you speak well of people and you're not cussing them out and you know all that other stuff, right? So we're pretending we're Christians today, okay? Uh, so when you speak, your voice, audio comes out, right? But also when you speak, Wind comes out, or breath, right? So he literally says that, but watch this. When you speak, you are expressing yourself. Now, watch this. You may have already been thinking what you're thinking, but the people on the outside do not really know what's going on in your mind until you express yourself through the audio that comes out of your mouth and it riding on the breath that comes out of your mouth as well. So when he says God's word, he's saying that God has expressed himself in this man named Jesus Christ. That if anybody wants to know what's on God's mind, well, first of all, if anybody wants to know God, they can look at Jesus. That he has literally revealed himself in Jesus. That's why Jesus said, Philip was like, yo, what's up with Jesus? Can we see the Father? He said, man, how long have you been with me, dog? He says, just exact dog. They use that. That's in the Aramaic. Um, <clears throat> so, so, so watch this. So, so, so he literally, watch this. He's, he says, he says, 
God has expressed himself through the word. This word was there in the beginning with God. So he gives you a clue as to what's happening in creation. He says that the father spoke the world into existence, right? But it's not the father just saying stuff. He's actually giving commands. It's his will. Because what's revealed is there's somebody in between God and his creation. And that's the word. The word then, he says, he says the word, right, all things were made through him. With the Father, he says, the Father spoke the word into existence, but, but through the Son, all things were made through him, that he is literally the agent of creation. So the Father speaks, the word builds the world, and watch this, the breath of life or the spirit of life keeps the world going. So that when God expresses himself in both word and breath, the word builds it, this breath keeps it alive. See, that's why the spirit of God, we don't have to invite him. If you're alive, the spirit of God is keeping you alive. Any life that exists on the planet, I don't care where it is, it is the spirit that is keeping it going. It is the son that built it, or the word that built it, or whoever you want to call him, Jesus, right? He built it. But it's the spirit that's keeping it going. Any of y'all seen um, uh, Pinocchio, Geppetto? Geppetto creates the puppet. He, he's the builder of the puppet. But something has to give the puppet life. That's what the spirit of God's job is. That's why he says the spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. So 1, 2, and 3 in Genesis 1 lets you know that the Elohim was there, lets you know that the spirit was doing stuff. But John himself is the one who reveals to you that Jesus was there. And since Jesus is there, and what you realize that John is saying by implication is that the world was created for the word. So when we're trying to discover what it is that God created the world and why there's suffering, shame, all this stuff, he says that he created the world good, right? But when you read it, there's something that should just like shake you. You're like, wait a minute, if he created the world good, why is the world like it is right now? Anybody got a world that's just like, man, I'm trying to understand what's happening in my life right now. Anybody? Right? Well, watch this. It does not catch God off guard that sin comes into the garden. It's not as if God was like, oh, my God, the world just went back. <laughs> right? There's a, he, there, he has a plan in mind. Remember, if this God wanted to reveal himself to the world, and therefore he created the world as a platform for his glory, before the word could come in, there had to be chaos so that the word can come and recreate in chaos. Because watch this, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to help y'all. Okay, watch this. So we'll get to verse 2, and he'll say that the world was without form and void, uh, meaning it didn't have a shape and there was nothing in it. We'll talk about that next week, how God is, is using both artists and architects to make a world. I, I don't have time today. But today, why? he says form and void, so that it was in chaos, right? So that God sees the chaos and then takes the chaos and reorders it. So that when sin comes into the world, the world now devolves into chaos. And that's why people can feel like they can say it's all about evolution. Because they look at the world and they see dog eat dog and they see all this disruption and they see all these people hating each other and wars and rumors of wars. They're like, look, man, it's meaningless. Well, see, John helps you to see in John chapter 1 that God was up to something. Because before he could reveal Jesus as the Redeemer, there had to be chaos so that he could come in. Because if God is the creator of the world, Jesus is the recreator of the world. So that he comes in and takes the chaos and changes it and makes it orderly. And so when we say, uh, I've been made a new creature, it's not just words on a page. It's actually life. It is the reason why God sent his son into the world. It is the reason why 
the whole creation was created so that God could get the glory through his son, Jesus Christ. Look, there is no name under heaven whereby we must be saved. It was given to Jesus. He literally is the word that became flesh and we are beholding his glory from glory to glory. He is full of grace and truth and he is coming to the world and he is not only looking at the chaos, but through his blood that was sacrificed on the cross and through his resurrection, he is now the firstborn of a new creation. And all those who name the name of Jesus are now being recreated into something new that when we look at the world, God is not just concerned with what's happening right here, but God is concerned with what's happening in your families. God is concerned with what's happening in your finances, in our banks, in our institutions, where we're working, where we're living, where we're playing, because he is literally Jesus is the first of a new creation. And the whole world is a stage. Even the suffering is a stage for God to get the glory through his son Jesus. Because without no suffering, there's no cross. <laughs> right? Without pain, there's no sacrifice. There's no sacrifice. There's no us looking at him. Now watch this. I want to show you this in the text, and I'm closing right here. Because some of you are like, uh, I thought the world was created for me. No, no, no. It was created for the glory of the Son. Uh, look, at, look at verse um, uh, Colossians 1.15. No, sorry, John 17, 24. Uh, no, I, I'm going to go to Colossians first, and I'm going to end with that. Colossians 1, 15 through 21 says this. He says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by, all, by him, all things were created, he's talking about Jesus, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him, and watch this, and for him. And, 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 and if, if it's created for him, what he will say is, verse 18, he'll say, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent in Jesus. He says, for in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And watch this. This is what he's doing right now. And through him, he's trying to reconcile all things, meaning all creation, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So in John 17, Jesus will say something. As I close, he'll say, Father, I desire that also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you've given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. Father, I desire that they also whom you give me, me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you've given me because you've been with me since before the foundation of the world. I want, I want to close with this. I can't, I can't. The Father has always been giving in light, love, joy, glory to his Son, even before there was a world. What that means is that power is not the first a measure of godliness, love is. Because before there was ever power, or well, there was always power, before there was ever a creation, God was always in relationship and loving relationship with his son. And he's so in love with his son that he created a world so that everyone else who he created could share in his love joy and admiration of his son. You ever had something you wanted to show off and it was good? You like, no, nah, I, I, you know, some of y'all go to the gram. I know y'all show off a lot of stuff, right? <laughs> right? And, and he, so he created the world so that he could show and display his son to the world. And so that those of us who find joy in him will then share with others who will share with others who will share with others. Look, man, you were created for a purpose. Your purpose was to give glory to the Son. And so, man, just as a word of application, I want you guys for this week, 
to spend some time this week praying to God, God, what for the next seven days, just a week, you may, you may not just make it through a week. Lord, what is it that you want me to do um, that will best glorify your son, Jesus Christ? Now, watch what I did, I did say. What is it that I want to do or what is it that you want me to do? Hear what I'm saying? I'm saying, what is it that you want me to do to glorify your son with my life? Just ask him. See what he says. Come back next week, and let's see what Origin Part 2 has to say, all right? Let's give God some glory. glory. Father, I thank you, Lord, for just all that you do. Lord, you, you are teaching us. You are ministering to us. I pray, God, that we can see that all things are to and for you. I pray, God, man, for those of us who've been struggling with purpose, for those of us who've been struggling with the chaos in our life, I pray, God, that we can see that, God, you've sent your son into the darkness to make us into new people. My see, Father, I pray, God, that you would help us to see that your son is the most beautiful thing in the whole entire universe. And Lord, I just pray, God, that right now, if there are people under the sound of my voice who are having a hard time struggling not just to see you as reasonable, and it's a good thing to do, but if there are people struggling to see you as beautiful, I pray, God, that by the power of your spirit, you would make it known to us. And I pray, God, that after today and during the rest of our worship gathering, Lord, I pray, God, that we could glorify you with one voice and that in worshiping you, we can see you even more. Father, I just pray these things. You who are the creator of heaven and earth and the recreator of men's souls and a new creation and a new plan and a new glory, we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give God some praise.